help. I have fallen and I can't get up. Oh my god, are you okay? Fallen in love? What? Hey, gay. There may not be a crisis of male friendship, but is there a crisis in your bedroom? What? Well, my friend, do I have an offer for you. Adam and Eve is the number one vendor of adult toys in my world, and they're offering 50% off one product, as well as free shipping in the US and Canada at adamandeve.com. Holy wow! All you gotta do is use this code, are they, to get this super special deal. Adam and Eve offers a wide variety of products for all types of folks with all types of plumbing. No matter your parts, your hearts, or your queer platonic not quite romantic love triangles, Adam and Eve has products that any adult can enjoy with themselves or others. Wait, what was the code again? Use code ARETHEY to get 50% off one product and also free shipping in the US and Canada at adamandeve.com. Incredible. Now, let's watch something homophobic. What? Men in crisis? Men. For centuries, members of the male gender have gathered together in a sanctimonious union of companionship, romantic friendships that have defined lives and generations. But now a new enemy has appeared to destroy the very fabric of male friendship which sustains our society, the homosexual. These homosexuals, the bottom dregs of civil society, have imposed their agenda on this most sacred of bonds between men. In bars, coffee shops, and even in the privacy of their own homes, men are afraid of even a simple touch between themselves because of this homosexual agenda. This class of creature, this imposition on society has caused a crisis of male friendship. Men can no longer enjoy their favorite pastimes like fondling balls or handling wood. Platonic intimacy is no longer sacred as long as the homosexual is allowed to roam the earth. Ah, the homosexuals. Everyone loves to talk about the homosexuals and all the things we love to allegedly destroy. I'm flattered you think so highly of my capabilities, but let me just rain on your parade before you rain on mine. Us gays, we're not really doing anything besides googling pictures to add to the James McAvoy shrine. Yeah. But apparently, male friends can't look each other in the eye anymore without their inner dude bro Paul Revere yelling, The gay is coming! The gay is coming! Avoid intimacy at all costs! Well, at least that's what I've heard from my YouTube comments. Why do these morons try to make everything gay? In case you didn't know, not every guy that has a best friend is gay. This video is ironically promoting toxic masculinity. Why can't dudes have a really close friendship without being called gay? Jeez, insane to me how two men being good friends is considered queer baiting nowadays. Like, come on, are men not allowed to be friends anymore? But I thought, oh, well, it's just like a YouTube comment thing, right? Some people just don't get the point of my videos and give them an uncharitable reading. So I just hid out in Gay Agenda headquarters for a while until I heard Captain America himself, Anthony Mackie, had something to say. So many things are twisted and convoluted. There's so many things that people latch onto with their own devices to make themselves relevant and rational. The idea of two guys being friends and loving each other in 2021 is a problem because of the exploitation of homosexuality. It used to be guys can be friends, we can hang out and it was cool, we would always meet your friends at the bar, you know? You can't do that anymore because something as pure and beautiful as homosexuality has been exploited by people who are trying to rationalize themselves. So something that's always been very important to me is showing a sensitive masculine figure. There's nothing more masculine than being a superhero and flying around and beating people up. But there's nothing more sensitive than having emotional conversations and a kindred spirit friendship with someone that you care about and love. Mm -hmm. And uh, are these exploiters of homosexuality in the room with us right now, Mr. Mackey? Okay, listen, I really respect Anthony Mackey. He's a good actor and seems like a nice dude, but he's echoing something which I think is problematic. On the one hand, 
Sure, he's pointing out a problem that is technically real. On average, male friendships are pretty emotionally unsatisfying, and generally, men fear emotional and physical intimacy with each other. Oftentimes, dudes avoid intimacy because of a fear of being seen as gay. So yeah, technically there is a problem. Now, what does Anthony Mackie mean when he says the exploitation of homosexuality? Sounds interesting. I didn't know Mr. Mackey was a student in my sociology class pretending he did the reading by throwing darts at vocabulary in his brain. But let's be fair here, I guess he might be talking about someone like me. Someone who likes to interpret fictional relationships with a queer lens. Mackey and people in his camp generally believe there's a crisis going on. And it goes something like this. Healthy displays of intimacy between male friends are good. There are people who interpret certain instances of male intimacy as gay. Men are afraid of being intimate because they are afraid of being labeled as gay. Therefore, we should stop interpreting instances of male intimacy as gay. Now, this somewhat vague collection of claims and conclusions leads people like Mackie and people in my comments to claim that there's a sort of crisis of male friendship. But if you actually start to think about the argument and its pieces, it starts to fall apart. Like, it kinda takes for granted that this fear of being labeled as gay is a genuine fear that should be humored. As if it were normal for all men in society to fear being labeled as a filthy, victorious, enjoying homosexual. But, let's say you want to modify the argument then. Maybe some people instead say, Men are afraid of being intimate because they are afraid of being labeled as an identity they do not identify with. Well, if that's your problem, then let me tell you about a funny thing called heteronormativity. Trust me, it's much more common for people to assume that a non-straight person is straight than vice versa. So if there's any crisis going on, then it's a crisis of my aunt asking me how my very special friend and roommate is doing. Okay, if not that, then maybe your real, real, final for sure argument is Men are afraid of being intimate with each other because they're uncomfortable with people speculating on their interpersonal relationships. Let me tell you about a funny thing called Twitter. Okay, so uh, this is more defensible. Publicly speculating on real life people's personal lives is pretty questionable and often shittily invasive. But what about speculation over fictional characters? If that's bad, then I guess we should arrest English teachers, right? Oh no! Who will gay high schoolers eat lunch with now? The problem with these arguments often isn't their statement of the problem. It's pretty easy to point out a problem. The hard part is figuring out the cause and the solution. The cause of men's fears of interpersonal intimacy with other men isn't gay people. And the solution to these fears isn't to ban anyone talking about fictional gay people. Listen, I'm a little bit of a man myself, so I understand the frustrations here. I acknowledge that there is some truth to the crisis of male friendship. Guys slap each other on the asses in the locker rooms, yet we can't even talk about our emotions like how much we love getting slapped on the ass. It's a weird world. There is a problem. But the response that many people have to queer interpretations of fictional characters, their ease in blaming the queer community over anyone else for this lack of male intimacy, and their desire to see all queer interpretations banned from discourse, demonstrates how homophobia is often covert or hidden under the guise of some constructed problem. No, I'm not homophobic. I just hate it when gay people breathe. Do you know how I know that the people who cry over the crisis of male friendship are suffering from a tad bit of cognitive dissonance? Because in nearly every movie, TV show, and book, male and female characters are rarely portrayed as platonic friends, and we all just accept that as the state of affairs. I rarely hear these people cry over the fact that audiences seem to blindly accept every straight love plot, even if all it takes for a romantic connection to be established between the straights is for the characters to look at each other one time. But God forbid we talk about same gender couples in the same way. I'm sure Anthony Mackie and these YouTube commenters aren't homophobic in the classical Mike Pence sense. And I'm sure they don't literally hate gay people. I mean, <laughs> Anthony Mackie is playing a bisexual character, right? You don't have to be explicitly and intentionally prejudiced to reproduce ideas that reinforce prejudice in a systemic or broad way. Wait, uh, broad way is too gay to be homophobic. Reinforce prejudice on a wider scale. And this isn't an Anthony Mackie problem. We all have this problem. We all have shit we need to work on and that doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't mean you need to be canceled. But you still gotta work on it, right? 
Let's get back to the crisis of male friendship. Where do men's fears of homosexuality actually come from? So Anthony Mackie referenced a better time, a time when dudes could be friends. Used to be guys can be friends. We can hang out and it was cool. I know, right? Time when dudes could be friends. A time when that little hole in the bathroom stall was just a place to say hello and give stock tips. What has the world come to? Now, I don't know about you, but besides a global pandemic, there's really nothing stopping bros from having a good time day drinking in Lake Havasu. So what the heck is Anthony Mackie actually talking about? See, the problem is he's right, but not in the right way. There was a time when friends could sleep in the same bed, hold hands, write emotional letters to each other, cuddle and kiss without people assuming anything other than a platonic relationship. And these relationships had existed for basically most of human history up until the mid 19th century. Historians like to call this phenomenon romantic friendships. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, those silly historians always know homoing my favorite historical gay lovers. While it is true that many historians have no homoed a great number of people over the years, it's also true that friendships back in the day were just different. Not just male friendships, but all friendships. People like to debate over some specific relationships. For example, Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence definitely got it on, but what about Abraham Lincoln and his bro Joshua Speed, whom he shared beds with and lived with for several years? It's totally reasonable to believe that they were just bros who expressed platonic man love within socially acceptable bounds. So what happened? Well, a real crisis of male friendship. People started to get more suspicious of same gender love. They began to fear that this platonic intimacy would turn sexual. We can't have that, can we? But it wasn't queer readings of media that prompted this society-wide anxiety over friendship. Instead, it was the foundations of homophobia that were just being laid down in Western Europe. So this category of homosexual, as we know it in modern Western society, is a relatively recent invention. The term homosexual was actually first coined by 19th century psychologist Carl Maria Kurt Benny in 1868. That's not to say that people didn't engage in homosexual practices like getting really into Hawaiian shirts for no reason before the 19th century. I mean, we have a whole lineage of Greek dilfs proving that wrong. What differentiated developing 19th century thought on sexuality from previous eras was this idea that someone could be a homosexual person, that someone could identify as a homosexual person and that this characteristic was some essential aspect of the self. Before the 19th century, people didn't identify as homosexual. Homosexuality was a practice, a social relation, not a way of being. But in the 19th century, the world was changing, knowledge was being institutionalized, and people, or what pretentious sociology majors like me like to call bourgeois society, sought ways of classifying human phenotypes and behavior. Psychiatric professionals of the late 19th century began to construct the homosexual as a distinct category of being. Now to prove that I really am a pretentious sociologist, let me just cite problematic thinker dude, Michel Foucault. In the 19th century, homosexuality appeared as one of the forms of sexuality when it was transposed from the practice of sodomy onto a kind of interior androgyny. The sodomite had been a temporary aberration. The homosexual was now a species. Traditionally, the category of sodomite described a practitioner of homosexual acts who committed temporary sins. But this new category of homosexual describes someone who was fundamentally different than the similarly new category of heterosexual. Like I said, that's not to say that people who love the same gender didn't exist before the 19th century. That's not what this interpretation of history says. It's simply stating that our conception of sexuality as something you are rather than as something you do is kind of a new idea. As a disclaimer, so homophobes don't horrifically misinterpret this video, if you identify and feel strongly connected to the 21st century conception of sexuality, that's not a bad thing, and it doesn't mean your identity isn't real or valid. I personally strongly identify as bisexual, and I know a lot of people who identify strongly as homosexual, and these identities carry a lot of meaning. 
What I'm saying is that our ways of understanding ourselves change over time and can be influenced by social factors. Like, I didn't choose to have same gender attraction, but the way I understand that attraction is mediated by my social world. Does that make sense? And as this very specific category of homosexual emerged, so too did homophobia, a fear of homosexuality, and more specifically, a fear of the person who engages in homosexuality as having some kind of inherent disease. As this idea of the homosexual became prevalent in the minds of the public, people started to regard intimate friendships with anxiety. Slowly, romantic friendships faded away with the tides of ambiguously homoerotic history. Now, why is this relevant to Anthony Mackie? Well, what he said is true. People used to be able to engage in highly intimate friendships without others batting an eye. But these friendships didn't deteriorate because of contemporary gays sticking their noses and other possibly phallic objects into the common discourse. The fear of intimacy between people of the same gender was a product of modernity. Not like the modern world as in our contemporary world, but like modernity as this historical and philosophical period that followed the Enlightenment. Modernity as the philosophical mode of thought that caused people in the 19th century to go, hey, tradition is cool, but what if instead we like make our society super efficient by holding up rationality and creating calculated categories that we think will help us be super productive and scientific, lol. Yeah, except that hyper-rationality and objectivity kind of couldn't be separated from the inherent biases that permeate our culture. High five for critical theory! Okay, off track, what's the point here? The point is, male friendship isn't dying. It's already dead, and it's been dead for like 200 years. But you know what killed friendship? Homophobia, not homos. Like in some ways, people in the YouTube comments are right. Straight guys are afraid of being seen as gay if they get intimate with the bros. But why should we uncritically support their fears and tell everyone else to shut up? Why is there such a negative association with being seen as a queer person? As history has shown, giving into anxieties over homosexuality doesn't promote healthy friendships, it kills them. Our problem is homophobia. If we destigmatize homosexuality, we destigmatize male intimacy. How do we destigmatize homosexuality? Uh, that's a long and arduous process and I don't have an answer for that. Should we start calling random guys gay and tell them to accept that? No, that's silly. I think imposing labels on other people and speculating about their personal life is weird and invasive. But you know what is a great way to express yourself and destigmatize cultural taboos? Fiction! Hey! I have an idea. What if we let queer people apply queer readings to fiction? What if we destigmatize positive portrayals of queerness on screen and thus destigmatize queerness in the real world? What a great idea! Some detractors might claim, Okay, but if you start saying that things like fictional men holding hands is gay, then people might start applying that way of thinking to real life. Well, let's think about that for a second. How do you even interpret fictional characters as being gay? Don't queer interpretations actually reinforce stereotypes and toxic masculinity by putting a box around behaviors and feelings even if they're fictional? <laughs> Shockingly, I have friends. I've platonically slept in the same bed as my male friends, I've hugged my friends, consensually slapped their asses, and even kissed men that I have absolutely no sexual or romantic feelings for. Given that fact, how can people like me analyze media and say something like, Oh my god, they're devouring each other with their eyes! Gays confirmed! Well, if you haven't noticed, fiction and real life are two different things. Fiction follows a script, there's a writer, and there's an audience. Real life doesn't have a writer. Real life is messy. Fiction is planned, right? So while there may be nothing inherently romantic about hugging someone, there's something to be said about why a writer would put certain displays of affection within a fictional work. When you're interpreting fiction, you're not interpreting it in the same way you would interpret a real life action. 
you take into consideration the audience, the intention, the symbolism, and the context. Like, uh, let's say you're F. Scott Fitzgerald and you're writing The Great Gatsby and you're also low-key homophobic. Let's say that literary scholars have noted that Fitzgerald tended to use homosexuality in his writings as a way of conveying a character's moral ambiguity. Now let's say we go back and analyze the book The Great Gatsby and use this gay context to think about why the narrator Nick talks so much about how handsome Gatsby is. His tan skin was drawn attractively tight on his face, and his short hair looked as though it were trimmed every day. I could see nothing sinister about him. Unironically, there's literally nothing inherently gay about appreciating another man's tight skin. I'm being serious, but within this context, maybe Nick's constant adoration of Gatsby is Fitzgerald's way of hinting at Nick's homosexuality. Maybe Fitzgerald wants to establish Nick as an unreliable narrator, so he uses queerness and other textual evidence to cause a type of unease in the readers of his time. Now, this isn't to say that we should uncritically support Fitzgerald's view that homosexuality indicates a type of moral failing. Perhaps failing math, but not morals. Either way, it's an important context to know, right? Doesn't it deepen our understanding of Fitzgerald's intentions? Yet English teachers across time and space never even think to discuss this interpretation, despite the fact that it's been talked about in academic circles since the 1970s. Are we really going to sacrifice potentially crucial pieces of knowledge to curb people's fears of queerness? Not all queer readings come in an academic context. Surely there are instances of random people on Tumblr going, Oh my god, two men touched each other in a TV show? That means they're gay! Like, you're right, who am I to say that a touch on the arm or a prolonged stare is gay, especially if you haven't read the literature first? Well, that's what the game of fiction is, isn't it? Who am I to say that the green light in Gatsby represents the American dream? It's just a green light, right? When you observe something in a fictional work, you have to understand that that something was put there. That green light means something. That scene in chapter two where Nick ends up by the bedside of another half-naked man means something. Oftentimes, when I see people criticize media over the lack of male intimacy on screen, I tend to generally agree with them, but then they blame gay people for ruining relationships that they have nothing to do with. Like, when I made my video on Sam and Bucky, so many people said that male intimacy was dying because of gay interpretations, despite the fact that they're winning. The straights got their intimate male friendship. Sam and Bucky are canonically close friends who had a lot of emotional moments. There you go. Please, I beg of you, tell me. Where are all these shows and movies where male friends are becoming gay lovers at alarming rates? Nearly all the relationships covered on this channel remain unconfirmed. You want your intimate male friendships? Try Bucky and Sam, Troy and Abed, John and Sherlock, Miguel and Tulio, Deadpool and Spider-Man, Lupin and Sirius Black, Keith and Lance, Merlin and Arthur, Bucky and Steve, Professor X and Magneto, Kirk and Spock, Poe and Finn. There's your intimate male friendships. Seems like a real crisis, huh? You must understand, when nearly all popular media portrays close male friendships, I struggle to see the crisis. I mean, let's just talk about the last one I mentioned, Poe and Finn. After the movie The Force Awakens, a lot of people interpreted the relationship between Poe and Finn as romantic. You know who one of those people was? Literally, the actor who plays Poe Oscar Isaac. These guys love each other, you know, and, and the truth is, as, as a performer, you know, I, I can only do so much because I don't get to write the scripts, but other than say, I would think that that would be a great way for the story to go and a much more original one, but I think that at least what, it, what we can say is that it, it holds that potential. It was like, these are two guys that, you know, are, He's happy being intimate with each other emotionally. Personally, I, I kind of hoped and wished that maybe that would have been ta taken further uh, in the other films, but you know, I don't have control over it. It seemed like a natural progression, but you know, this, it's still, sadly enough, it's like a, you know, it's a time when people are too afraid, I think. Oscar Isaac, 
unrelentingly defended the romantic connection between Finn and Poe. The audience felt it, the actors felt it, this was a real opportunity for original, unique, and groundbreaking queer representation. And in this so-called era of collapsing on-screen male friendships, what happened? Did the homosexual agenda take over Star Wars and force guys to be gay together? No. Disney wouldn't let it happen. Of course they wouldn't, because that's the real crisis here. Yes, we should continue to portray platonic male intimacy on screen in a healthy way. But tell me, when queer relationships and interpretations are constantly erased, pushed to the side, or even called predatory because somehow gayness isn't letting bros be friends anymore, what's the real crisis? Mackie is true in saying that we need more portrayals of intimate platonic friendships between masculine men, but at least we've had some good ones so far. But is it really fair to compare the relative underrepresentation of emotional male bonds to the absolute invisibility of queer relationships in big franchises? I don't understand it. Maybe I do. Homophobia is tricky. Sometimes we don't think we're being homophobic, and really by most people's definitions, we aren't. And while concern over male intimacy isn't inherently homophobic, and even a noble thing to be worried about, blaming queer interpretations does nothing to help the original problem, and it creates problems of its own. It places the blame in the wrong direction, and it takes for granted the fear of queerness as a legitimate concern, thus perpetuating a type of covert homophobia. Queer people have a long history of reading subtextual cues in media that may not be apparent to the straights. For much of the history of film, open queerness was banned by the Hayes Code, and thus queerness had to be communicated through subtext, aesthetics, and illusion. Even though the Hayes Code isn't really around anymore, subtext, symbolism, and queerness remain inexorably linked. There's nothing inherently gay about rainbows or lavender, right? But if you walk into a neighborhood and you see rainbow flags on every business, on every crosswalk, and on the cocksock of every bystander, what do you think is being communicated? It's a gay neighborhood, right? So when queer people watch movies or consume media, they look for their own versions of rainbow flags because of the fact that queerness has historically existed in the shadows under coded language. There's nothing wrong with people acknowledging possible subtext within fictional works. There really isn't. You might argue that someone might approach something uncritically and implicitly endorse some weird standard, but to say that queer interpretations are at the core of dudes' inabilities to look each other in the eye? I don't buy it, sorry. And uh, here's an idea. Since when have gay romantic relationships not been a legitimate form of male intimacy? If people like Anthony Mackie want to see men being sensitive with each other, perhaps we should consider the fact that queer people have been challenging the rigid confines of masculinity for like, ever? Oh, but not those people, right? We want to encourage the normal type of male intimacy. This isn't a call to destroy Anthony Mackie or anyone else who talks about the crisis of male friendship. And I saw a lot of people try to viciously cancel Mackie when he first made his statements. Canceling Anthony Mackie isn't going to solve toxic masculinity. And also I love this picture of him and I think we should forgive him just for that, don't you think? Mr. Mackie, let's think of this video as a call to critically reflect a little bit more about who we point fingers at first. Hey, gay. You want to act gaily daily? Well, here's a few ways you can do that. Support this channel by checking out my merch at www.itsall.gay or consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, remember to follow my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe. Anyways, these are some people who are acting gaily daily. My patrons. Grackle, Kara, Duncan, Lorenzo J. Yanes Jr. Blue Lou, Queer Space Girl, Anarchali Ascari, Darren Mad, Wictor, Delany Broom, Elizabeth Acosta, Violet, Amara, Marie Jean Boyer, E, J Patrick, Evan P, Kebu, Steffi, Cece, Knights Who Say Sledge, Inar Dominguez Elvira, Anna Tchaikovska, Etienne, Jessica Carmona, Night Tripping Fairy, Testy Tara, Mickey McCommons, Nadine Ferris, Savannah, Leonardis Sardinianis, Miguel Galan de Juana, Kirsten Robbins, Tanya P, Rowan, 
Roman Rosari, Cece Troyer, Corvus Blair, Violet Fabiana, Adrienne Jackson, K, Maddie Reyes, Arson Bell, Cody Miller, Juicebox08, Sirica Nikulin, The Kimchi Witch, Cucumber, AFK Bard, Feeler, Ryro, Del Elliott, Charlotte, Megalomaniac64, Madison Fife, Kale, Gabriella Day, Shido, Polina Rakitska, Zetotron, Marie, Austin Cheatham, Gary K, Sean O'Neill, Whitney Welts, Cooper, Mally Drew G, 